Chandigarh Lalit Kala Academy welcomes you to its grand annual offering, a sumptuous week-long banquet of art with the choicest fare from leading artists and contemporary masters. This year being the 100th birth anniversary of the renowned Amrita Shekhar, the Art Week has been dedicated in memory of her contribution to art. It is a privilege to have amongst us Shri K. K. Sharma, the advisor to the administrator, Chandigarh administration, to inaugurate this Art Week. May I request Mr. Devan Manna to welcome you all. As we all know, I don't really need to tell all of you about Amrita Shergil. She was an icon and she was somebody who belonged to this soil. Though she was not born here, but uh, beat Lahore, it was part of us, then she went to Shimla, then now Shimla was also a capital of Punjab, now Chandigarh is the capital of Punjab, so we can somehow claim that she is ours. I welcome Mrs. Anjali Elamenan, the second time to the Lalit Kala Academy. She's so generous, so kind, that whenever we have requested her, in spite of all the engagements, she always says yes, she never says no to Chandigarh. Thank you so much. And I welcome Shri S. Kalidas, a renowned scholar, writer on art and music, and the son of the great J. Swami Nathanji. Thank you so much for being with us. These two giants of Indian art, two thinkers, they will engage in a dialogue. We thought of this festival long time ago because we wanted to dedicate something to Amrita Shergilji. Now, Chandigarh, as we all know, is a city which has intellectuals, scholars, writers, painters, theatre personalities, all kinds of people who are interested in the arts as such. And then we thought, why not have a festival in which thinkers, writers, curators, critics, historians and artists, they get together and discuss whatever is ailing, whatever is happening in the field of art. Now, I do not need to speak about Anjali ji. She is one of the most innovative, most creative, most up-to-date, most contemporary, most productive you know, <laughs> artists amongst us and probably uh, very young in, in terms of her thinking because you know, that's why there are other artists also. We have you know, requested her to be amongst <laughs> this group because apart from being you know, creatively active for more than five to six decades, she's still contemporary. She still thinks about the contemporary themes and times. Thank you very much for being with us. Sir, may I request you to please come on stage and formally inaugurate the festival as well as release the catalogue for the Amrita Shergil National Art Week. Thank you. Thanks a lot. When I came back from Paris, I, I was teaching at Lovedale because I suddenly, having had all the freedom in Paris, suddenly I come home and my father says, what time are you coming home? So as soon as I got a job, I immediately went off to Lovedale, which had been my old school. By this time, Sushil Mukherjee, my uh, great teacher and mentor, was no longer there. And I worked there. And then I got married, so I was about to leave. And uh, amongst a few candidates that came to take that post was Swami. And of course, they, they were he was in his usual disheveled manner, with his wild beard, his long hair, and his kurta pajama and a shawl. Uh, and the, uh, but the headmaster was very impressed with the power of his personality and he said, well, when, w when will you be ready to join? So Swami gave some kind of a vague date, he didn't quite commit himself. And then the bursar called him and said, well, you know, uh, sir, that when you come here to teach, you will have to perhaps have a haircut <coughs> and uh, you will have to wear a suit or at least a jacket. Swami said, bye, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not interested in this job. So, I don't know who came after that. I think it's Munaswami. Uh -huh. yes. So, Anjali ji, when you, when you look back, what, what is the one thing that you think has made the lot of the artists easier? Her commerce. <laughs> The market, the horrible market, where we've all become commodified, but at least they, we stopped going around on bicycles, we could have a car, uh, <laughs> lead a decent life. Uh, 
between the Navy that paid my husband exactly 450 rupees when we got married and me as an artist, we were damn poor. <laughs> and one thing that has made it more difficult. Oh. The commodification. Also. Again, the same thing has made it more difficult because it's um, begun to quantify art in terms of money, which is really very sad for us. And these days, I mean, of course, I quoted my father saying that Satish Kuhiraz had protested that easel art is dead. You always mirrored away from easel art very often. You painted objects mm -hmm. long mm -hmm. before objects were you know, becoming fashionable and long before installations were there. So, what, what led you to, to preempt the, the, the flow of the art movement as it were? Well, you know, I have always been so, big. as I said, I paint every day and I seem to have created <laughs> perhaps too many paintings, but I really don't have, I have not had time to sit and ponder these uh, uh, questions. I'm still working very hard. I'm half the day on a scaffolding. Uh, so I come back pretty tired and haven't had time. Sometimes I have these debates with younger artists, but um, I don't have time to, I think there will be time when I can no longer paint. I hope that day never comes when one can sit and look back and then put it all together. Yes. And when you do, uh, when you do interact with younger people, mm -hmm. what is it that you feel that that resonates with your with your kind of thing because as, as I keep saying, repeating myself, you were one person from my father's generation who uh, whose whose mind worked in in the directions that uh, you know which which we might think as exclusively twenty first century or late twentieth century or and was it was it because of you travelled so much or you. No, it was, I said, uh, it was just out of sheer boredom with what I was what doing. Way? I wanted to break out and do, I, mean, I think all artists want to find something else to do. And when I was talking about the artist struggle, I didn't finish that sentence. The struggle really is to make the transition from one thing that you're doing to the next. And sometimes you see a high wall and to climb that wall and see what's on the other side uh, can lead to great anguish, to great anguish. Uh, and then recently, for example, there has been a lot of debate about the nude and I see that you hardly paint anybody with clothes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have a very large uh, a new male nude uh, painting of, uh, I went to the Ardha Kumbh, which I think was the most fantastic experience. I, I, it was really an epiphany uh, experience that I've ever had. And there were all these Naga Sadhus, hundreds of them and they uh, were covered in ash. So they looked like uh, statues. But when they jumped into the water and came out, they looked like naked men. <laughs> and, uh, so, but I think the human body uh, is uh, eternally f fascinating to paint. <coughs> and how, what do you have to say to those who say that this is not our tradition? Well, it is our, <laughs> unfortunately, it is our tradition. Uh, the other day on NDTV, there was this whole debate going on. And I have a very small uh, uh, Parvati. Uh, it's it's, an, it's um, uh, Chola bronze. And she didn't have much clothing on. There was some sort of jewelry on the lower half, but certainly topless. And I showed this and I said, this is hundreds of years old, you know. And uh, I said, well, there's a Chinnamasta Kali in every Bengali puja room. She's stalkers, she's absolutely naked, nude, uh, and standing uh, on a prone body. So what could be stronger and more powerful than that? But I think... Uh, you see yourself as a feminist? I never had a chance, I got married so young. <laughs> <laughs> I got completely dominated uh, by my husband and two sons. Unfortunately, I have some granddaughters now, so we are a team. <laughs> team against it. <laughs> no, I'm not really a feminist. I'm, on a, I'm a feminist on behalf of the other half of the women of India, or well, the other three quarters. I'm not a feminist on behalf of women like me. I think educated women in India are the most fortunate women 
in the world because we can still afford help. <coughs> and I think to a great extent, I know this sounds to trivialize it, but the feminist movement in, in uh, abroad was an anti-household movement. <laughs> I mean, there you are, you have a degree from Harvard or you've you know, got a, a fantastic PhD and then next thing you're talking baby talk and you tie it to the kitchen sink. And those women just rebelled. Um, but they regretted it, a lot of them regretted it afterwards. You see, I think uh, the idea of uh, the balance is so much in our tradition of uh, the male and female uh, that I don't think there's room for that kind of feminism. Why should we isolate one part of humanity? I think uh, humanity exists in that amazing balance between the male element and the female. It's abused, of course. I, I'm against the abuse of that. And you did draw our attention to the fact that a woman sees mm. the body differently than a man would mm. in mm. your remarks about Sousa, of course. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and uh, what do you think um, Is, uh, the, the number of women artists mm. has risen, but mm. uh, there's still very few compared to the numbers of men, in, not only in visual arts, but in, mm -hmm. even as writers, for example. Mm -hmm. No, I don't agree with you, Kali. I think some of the greatest practitioners of art today uh, in this country are women. You look at this list, there's only Atul there and eventually uh, Devan, and, and Devan actually talking about, uh, not him, about himself, but again about the greatest woman painter. Oh, do tell us what you think about Amrita, for example. Oh, she was absolutely, I mean, as a young uh, girl growing up in Delhi, I would go every week to the National Gallery and just gaze at the Shergills. I think she was... Uh, I feel that she was at the bedrock of the whole Indian art movement is lies with Amrita. And uh, what is incredible is, do you know all, do all of you know how old she was when she died? 28. And that body of work that she's created at that age and the maturity of it and that transition, I mean, I, she was at the Bazaar like I was uh, many years later. And the transition from that academic European uh, painting that she was, was so drilled into her and hungry and all that. And then to have distilled the beauty of, uh, of course, the paintings, many of them were like a sort of, uh, 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 what's the word? Not, not a pageant. Anyway, uh, the, they were very still and these groupings of both the Punjab paintings and the South Indian ones were so utterly exquisite. The height of aesthetic sensibility uh, is represented in the Shergill paintings. Of course, many years later, beauty has become a dirty word and I've been a victim of being accused of um, uh, painting paintings that were too beautiful, you know, uh, by a critic called Timothy Hyman who took these slides, he looked at them, he said, oh my God, these are beautiful, you know. And <laughs> so, uh, one has suffered from that, that uh, he was, I was stuck in a sort of time warp uh, and by that uh, description so would Amrita be, where her works were just utterly beautiful. But I admire her more than anything else. And just curiously, mm -hmm. did, had you seen the, the open heart of Vida Carlos before you? I hadn't, so it was just oh, an amazing, amazing. I mean Frida Kahlo uh, had the courage to paint herself and what was going on and her own pain and her angst and everything. Whereas her horrid husband Diego uh, painted... Who oh, by the way was also involved, the, that whole scene was also involved in the murder of Trotsky and the of communist course, movement. Yes. <laughs> but uh, he was uh, doing these grandiose political uh, murals uh -huh. which were, which are spectacular. But I, th I think that she in her own way was a greater painter. Good. Well, that's a woman's point. <laughs> yeah. Would the audience like any questions to Anjali? Um, uh, why is it that children today, uh, not today, actually over the years, even when I was growing up, uh, taught art in, in, in a very straight-jacketed manner? Yes. You know, they, they told to 
to not let their imagination run free, but uh, you know, you have to do things in a particular manner. And what they end up doing is actually copying uh, other artists' work and never developing their own, uh, you know. Big lacuna. They aren't the art. They aren't the teachers to teach. The, I mean, first you have to teach the teachers and uh, change the syllabi. Uh, it, it is. I have just uh, was called as a judge for five, no, it was 1500 village children uh, who were called for a painting contest. And there were at least 100 or 150 uh, drawings or paintings of house, you know, house. <coughs> so I asked them, I said, Aap aise ghar mein rehte ho? Nahi. To kaha se sikha hai aise ghar? Uh, teacher ne sikhaya. So the teacher is making this drawing of house uh, that we all know about and then there's flower pot which is a pot one flower two leaves <laughs> and then of course there's mountain three <coughs> mountains and a sun <laughs> and, and out of these 1500 children at least 500 were painting this nonsense uh, and nobody was being uh, able to express themselves I don't know what the answer, where the answer to this lies. But you know, con taking from that, your generation was perhaps lucky because you had those those first or second generation teachers from Shantanikhan. Vivan Sundaram, for example, mm. is also mentions his teacher, mm. teacher Sudhir Khastagir, mm. who was also from Shantanikhan. Yeah. And uh, it just struck me as uh, just now that perhaps, uh, perhaps there was something about that generation that Tagore created a generation who went out and taught hmm. uh, art in with children and uh, which no longer happens. I mean, even if uh, art, uh, you know, I mean, even if a, a, a Shantiniketan student would not go to teach in a school hmm. today, hmm. but even if they did... No, because they have aspirations that they're going to hit the market, which uh, unfortunately there's a big slump and they're not hitting the market. <laughs> so they will be back in the schools. I mean, when we, why did I go to work in a school? There was no other option. Nobody was buying paintings at that time. And why did a great painter like Swami even come to a school to get uh, interviewed? Because we had no options. Uh, there was no market. There was no one buying paintings. We had to live. We had to it's live. not really a question things. so much as an experience. Uh, when I worked with Swami Nathan in Bharat Bhavan, he had uh, started this program where he was getting teachers from different mm. art mm. colleges mm. all over Madhya Pradesh mm. and actually teaching them how to look at a work of art That's and wonderful. also examining their work mm. and trying to, in his own way, uh, very gently, uh, tell them which direction in which to deal with mm. young students mm. and I mm. thought even at that time that this was such an amazingly um, perceptive, insightful and visionary mm. uh, task to take. This is much before Bharat Bhavan came up as a building, as a physical mm -hmm. space. Mm. Uh, uh, Swami Nathan and Nirmal and Karanji had arrived much before mm -hmm. uh, it came as a physical concept, mm -hmm. but they were creating, you know, to receive yeah. the kind of cultural complex it was. You had to also create a community of people who would support it and respond to it artistically. So you had to create a way of seeing and a way of experiencing works of art. And I think that really created uh, uh, great roots into, uh, especially when he was setting up the Folk and Tribal Museum, and they were going off to Bastar and Chandwara and Pina mm -hmm. and Guna. And even in the tribal art, mm -hmm. in the traditional art, mm -hmm. the terracotta was being made for, I don't mean it in a derogatory yeah. way, but for what you would call mass consumption in Dili Hat. Mm -hmm. And then there was the original impulse of the artist. So he also somewhere made this group of teachers that he took with him on this journey to be able to discern between Mm -hmm. what was coming from the, the um, sensibility of their relationship with the gods and goddesses that they were making mm -hmm. and what was the mass product.
So I think we need those kind of teachers. Really, Absolutely. You know. but. Thank you. Uh, Iqbal Judge, when she was introducing you, said something very, uh, very interesting, which I'm sure all artists uh, at some point talk about. And she said that you think in color. And I was thinking, what does it mean to think in color? Uh, it really means that I don't draw very much. I mean, there's usually a process by which a, a, a work of art is made or finished. And perhaps, uh, I think that perhaps Swami also thought in color. When you see some of his great works, uh, you don't see the idea that there's a pencil that makes a drawing and then you fill it up later. You're, you're already thinking from the beginning in color. It's the color Very that often you're making the object because you to use that, that color, color. Yeah, yeah. So I just start with paint. I hardly draw. Mm -hmm. I mean, I draw separately in sketchbooks, but when I'm painting, I don't draw it out. How first. does that happen when you're working with a medium like glass? Oh, that was just amazing. Uh, I what I actually had to finally do because Manjit had also gone mm -hmm. to that same. Okay. Not, he had not gone. He'd sent drawings, mm -hmm. and they made ridiculous. Uh, they they made a shivling that looks like an egg, you know, <laughs> like that, instead of, this is a different form to it. And so finally I made the objects in fiberglass uh, in India and took them there and then it was translated uh, by the, uh, by the Murano, uh, Murano glass, glass, glass makers. Glass. Some of it I managed to turn uh, myself, which were rather smaller, but the big ones, I just had skinny wrists, I, I just couldn't hold that. Uh, very heavy. And it's very hot. It's ten, it's very hot. <laughs> and we'd work in the, I used to work two shifts in the furnace, which was 16 hours a day, and you get completely uh, dehydrated. Yeah. But it was lovely. Anyone else? <coughs> Just a second. <coughs> I'm very happy that at least there is one young uh, person who is asking the question. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. Uh, hello, ma'am. And uh, I've been painting, uh, I mean, trying to be in painting since I was a child. So there has always been uh, a question in my mind. Is there a fine line of distinction between visual arts and performing arts? Or are they same? Can they be integrated? Well, now everything's being integrated. Now there are no lines left anymore between sculpture, there are no more lines to break. There are no more lines or barriers to break, which is wonderful. We didn't have that when we were younger, and it's a bit late for us to do it now. Mm. But uh, yes, uh, it is. You can, there is performance art now, and there's land art, there's performance art. There's it was also art. always so, if we, if we look at our uh, uh, folk life, for example, there are, uh, in fact, um, the act of drawing a column or a what do you call it in Hindi? Um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 an alpana mm -hmm. is a performance, you know. Yeah. Uh, and there is one more silly question. And for some time, uh, we friends have been discussing one thing. Is black a color or absence of color? Oh. <laughs> oh. So that is not an artistic question. It's a philosophical one. <laughs> <laughs> a metaphysical one. Um, it's like the shunya, isn't it? Uh, the void. Yes, I think it's a color. Well, it's a pigment, certainly, and it's a pigment we all use. Uh, do you, do we see black differently than, say, a, a, a person who who has lived in a, a, in Europe or comes with that baggage? I mean, is there an Indian black or a European black? Hmm. Good question to ponder. I think you ponder that one. The next time I hear. <laughs> You can tell us uh, what you thought. I don't know. I haven't. White. It's actually. What about white? Is white a color? That's. Uh, uh, it, our uh, study of art takes us to Aristotle. Uh, I am speaking here, please. Okay. Uh, okay. Aristotle. Aristotle said that art is the imitation of an idea. Hmm. Do you? Uh, subscribe to this view that basically all paintings and all art emanates from an idea which comes to your to your head 
and then you translate it into various forms. Do you, do you agree yeah, with yeah, that absolutely. classical definition of art? Absolutely, uh, but uh, it varies from painter to painter. Uh, some, like me, I think I let the painting make itself as I'm going along. Unless there's a series, sometimes that's a bit more deliberate that you're doing a series. Uh, I'm just uh, doing a series called The Divine Mothers. And uh, uh, so that is a series. There was a series of windows. So those are a little more cerebral in the sense that you're thinking about how we'll do it next. But many paintings simply make themselves. Uh, perhaps the, the germ of an idea is there, but um, not necessarily a painting, the manifestation of an idea. Not necessarily. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, here. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, my question uh, related to your one of uh, your painting shown here, uh, shown here that uh, a mother and uh, son is sitting together, and uh, you have used shadow hmm. thing over there. Uh, reflection. So, reflections. Hmm. So, uh, as you said, you don't belong to some, but any any particular hmm. uh, sector or school. I have uh, see, uh, there was a sign of uh, arrow hmm. indicating from. Uh, head of uh, the shadow mm. of a son mm. and uh, towards the mother. Mm. So if you could draw some light uh, about that. And one more, uh, I would like to ask one more question. Uh, I found uh, crows very mysteriously in your paintings. Mm. Uh, most of, sh uh, mm. I think 20, 25 paintings you have shown. And almost 15 had crows. Had crows. Yes. So if you could draw some light on that mm -hmm. also. So. Um. Yes, the crows are there, and they, they make themselves absent. All those years that I was in Germany, I never painted a crow. <laughs> uh, they were ravens, and they weren't yeah. like our crows at all. They were sort of, uh, the raven is different from the crow. The crow is not there just because he looks that way. He has a certain personality. He is a very human, uh, the, the closest. And I think a monkey is also very close to us, and uh, from the bird world, the crow is. Um, arrow. Now, I think uh, what we do is we tend to, artists tend to do that. We make a big composition and then you embellish. You embellish either with the detail or you embellish with uh, something that not, need not be beautiful. But I often embellish it with, uh, say, an arrow or this uh, scar, uh, the cut scar. That was also, that's in a, a form of embellishment. Uh, or a halo, uh, or blood, the stigmata. Uh, these are details that you add. Like a uh, piercing. Yes. Yes. So there is a young lady here. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is going to be the second last question, please. Okay. Thank you. This one for Kali. Uh, it's for you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, ma'am. Um, my question comes out of more of personal experience that I hope that you will be able to help me with. Um, I have been doing self-portrait photography since the last uh, six, seven years. And for me, it's therapeutic. Mm. Um, Narcissistic? <laughs> I'm, I'm coming to that because um, for me, that's how I make sense of my world. Um, because I have Asperger's syndrome, you see things in color. I see things, I dream, and I visualize only in black and white. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when, as an artist, when we um, share our work publicly, you know, it's, it's then we are sharing a part of our identity, our life with Absolutely. larger public, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's all up to them what they have to say. Mm -hmm. And um, when they use words like narcissistic, I believe that... Um, no, I was just joking. No, no, no. I, I have been, you know, told that mm -hmm. that's narcissistic because you're doing self-portraits, etc., etc. You can afford to be narcissistic et cetera, et cetera. because you're a very beautiful young woman. <laughs> <laughs> Irrespective of that, I think that, you know, it's more to do with you being a beautiful person and not just you being somebody who's uh, uh, beautiful to look at. But my question is that, is it not a good thing that, thank God, people like us are narcissistic? Because an artist is somebody who's supposed to create. And an artist is somebody who would rather 
create out of his own imagination and share his own self mm. understanding of his own thing mm. S- and instead of you know only trying to um, take in what the society might like what it expects and you know spit out everything in the name of art i mean thank god people like us are self obsessed but the question is because that's where originality comes from no matter how people take it but the thing is that what i want to know is that how does an artist deal with that kind of negative feedback because you've taken the courage and you've let your artwork you know be shared publicly but then you see, when, when it is once you go out into the public domain you have to take what what comes at you and sometimes you get flack sometimes you get praise and um, i haven't talked about my religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs but i think i have been uh, very consciously trying to uh, be a karma yogi but it has its own rules and one of the rules of the, of choosing that path to atman or whatever it is which one struggles one whole life sometimes you get there sometimes you don't is that you must detach yourself from either the blame or the praise the fruits of what you do should not matter i know it's difficult i've tried uh, for for many years i don't say i've succeeded totally but uh, i think that's what you need to do if you are expressing what you are expressing then you have to ignore once you put it in the public domain you have to ignore what happens to it then it's gone out of your hands you've surrendered it and then whoever uh, talks about it or criticizes it or loves it you have to keep them apart that that's my advice but you know uh, speak make has a program where they ask uh, they ask various um, uh, musicians and artists to take on Uh, a few chelas during the summer uh, three or four of them and they said this is the guru chela parampara and i explained to the man whom i admire very much who runs pikmeke i said there is no such thing as t- being a guru for one month hmm? once you have taken someone as your chela they are there for life they come back with their babies they come back with their husbands you have to go to their weddings their births their deaths you have to continue to look at their work and now that is that growing body of these chelas because a few come every year now there are about 10 or 12 of them and uh, really it's uh, a great dedi- you have to be very dedicated to continue to interact with them because some do well some don't do well and but they lean extremely heavily so your guru is somebody who takes you on for life and uh, out of all the ones that you teach you can be a guru to only some of them you can't be a guru to hundreds of children i mean that's what Just i can say without of inquisitiveness uh, the crow is missing from the street <laughs> no 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 must be there too yeah yeah there is i would name about whom it was it is uh, with due apologies to professor goswami and uh, you know uh, kalidas ji wo likhne padhne wale logon ke bare mein comment kar rahe the ke wo dekhte nahi padhte hain ye aksar hamare hum sab ke sath hote hain only a reference to some it's a reference to most of us because we need some kind of a support to understand something you know because uh, the the language which is spoken language the written language probably the oldest you know or maybe more understood more taught that that's why so i i don't find fault with you and many of us might have missed that and i must thank anjali ji and uh, kalidas ji do you have to say something after this and without prof goswami because see we are celebrating amrita shergill's you know 100th birthday here and she was an icon of course there is an icon sitting in front of us here no, no, and no. there is an icon here without his blessings this art week cannot begin prasad goswami i can only be an intrusion upon a wonderful evening um i'd like to speak on behalf of the audience you know when i was listening to kalidas and to anjali 
You know, an image was flashing across my mind of an Abhishek in a great South Indian temple. You know, when an um, image is being bathed, lustrated, of let's say the great Nataraj, then five different objects or things are poured over that to bathe the thing. There can be a layer of dahi, there is a layer of ghee, honey, there is a layer of sugar and so on and so forth. And it's a wonderful, it's a very, very attractive and an elevating sight to see how the same image keeps changing. How layer upon layer is being either added or removed and so on. I am personally, I'm among my many weaknesses is a that I feel very moved by honesty. And the layers that I saw or heard this particular evening, first when Kalidas was speaking and then when Anjali was speaking, moves me a great deal. Because there is complete honesty in what we heard. Total, complete honesty. Informed by wit, informed by a depth of knowledge and information, and so on. And I am very grateful that I got the opportunity to be here this particular evening. You know, these things have to come to an end and I'm sure that you will be all back here tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. What is that famous Chinese proverb? The line never ends, you have to lift the brush. Yeah. Right? So you really have to lift the brush. I mean, these things have to come to an end. But may I say how moved I am once again by the, you know, the complete lack of artifice in what these two distinguished people on this stage brought to our evening. Kalidas is an old friend. I've admired him a great deal. His writing, his, the depth of his information, knowledge, capacity to analyze. Anjali, I've had the honor and the pleasure of not introducing, but speaking like this uh, some months ago and so on and so forth. And I am a great admirer of, his work, of her work. So it's a privilege and something that we have been made uh, a part of. May I thank you, Kalidasi. May I thank you, Anjali. Thank you.